I'm Rob Macedo. My amateur radio call is KD1CY. I'm the director of operations for the VOIP Hurricane Net. I'm also the uh, regional Skywarn coordinator for the National Weather Service office in Taunton, Massachusetts. I'm a volunteer there. I've been doing that for about 20 years. I'm going to talk a bit about the VOIP Hurricane Net. And I'm also going to talk about best practices for Skywarn for tropical systems. So, you know, we haven't had a lot of hurricane activity. We have had a lot of tropical systems affect various areas or post-tropical systems that have had significant impact. And to, in my mind, that is a way of preparing ourselves because some of these systems have done damage and had impacts that were as big as some of our major hurricanes. I mean, if you tell pe folks in New Jersey and New York City that Hurricane Sandy was a post-tropical system or a non-major hurricane, they'll look at you funny, right? But by the meteorology, you know, at, you know, even if you consider that it was a hurricane, its intensity was category one, but there were a lot of other factors that made that system strong. We'll talk a little bit about that and how we have to posture ourselves to be ready to provide that critical link of information for situational awareness and how the hurricane nets help but even if we have a system that is below hurricane strength, how important it is for folks at the local and regional level of their Skywind programs to be active. So uh, first we'll start with the VOIP hurricane net. How many folks have heard of the VOIP hurricane net, the Yekolink IRLP uh, system? Okay, so about half the room. So uh, as Julio pointed out, we've been uh, working with um, WX4NHC since 2004. Our goal is to provide surface reports, damage information, weather data, much of which from a United States perspective or a, Canada, a Canadian perspective is like the criteria we would get from a Skywarn or Canwarn program. Uh, you know, same criteria as the type of information that we're looking for. Um, also provide interoperability between National Weather Service offices and the Hurricane Center, EOCs with their weather service offices and the Hurricane Center as needed. Um, we are trying to gather information from folks that may not have their HF license, may not have the ability to have an HF station. Um, with, it's complementary. It's another way to get the data out. There isn't, you know, our way is right or, the, you know, it, it's about getting it whatever way you can through HF on the Hurricane Watch Net, through the VOIP Hurricane Net, with whatever means you have available to get the data uh, first to your local folks and also to the hurricane center in a hurricane situation. Um, we uh, provide a, a, a liaison uh, to other nets uh, that may be on Echo Link and IRLP, so maybe they have a path on IRLP, but they want to keep their net local. We can have somebody monitor that net and relay the information, or they could send a liaison to us. We'll also disseminate the National Hurricane Center advisories uh, and updates. We continue to be on the WX Talk Echo Link conference an IRLP reflector 9219. We have some backup systems. All this is on our website, voipwx.net. We are also on social media as well. Our activation policy is to activate whenever we have a radio path into the area. Uh, and then when we don't have those paths, we look at some other creative ways to get whatever information we can get to WX4NHC. And I'll talk about that because this past year was kind of an example of where we didn't have a lot of radio pass, but we had some other ways to gather some information, send it to WX4NHC that we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, we will self-activate our net when required if we have a system that is suddenly intensifies to hurricane unexpectedly. Uh, a good example of that was in 2005 with Hurricane Emily. This was a system that was forecast to become a hurricane, looked like it wasn't going to make it. You know, we activation, we, we canceled the activation, looked like it was going to get through the Caribbean islands without intensifying, and then rapidly intensified within six hours and became a hurricane, and it was, oh, by the way, after midnight. <laughs> so talk about a, a stretch to try to see what we could do to get information, but we were able to get some information from the Caribbean islands, uh, from Grenada, uh, from uh, relays from some of the surrounding islands, we uh, liaison to the Caribbean Emergency Weather Net on 75 meters that provided uh, reports of the damage that was occurring in Grenada, parts of Trinidad, parts of Tobago. And it was a case where we essentially self-activated ourselves uh, to uh, get the information out and, and into WX4NHC. Uh, so just an, an example of, of a self-activation uh, that we have done. 
Uh, we have a net management team, a number of us uh, uh, that uh, maintain the net and both our uh, regular prep net that we hold uh, monthly in the non-hurricane season months and weekly during the hurricane season months. Uh, we monitor all the different outlooks and discussions. When it gets close to land areas, if it's a hurricane, we look at activating uh, uh, the net and coordinating with Julio and John at WH4NHC and, and, and Bobby is doing the same with them. And we all kind of keep in touch with what our, our, our net plans are. Uh, I mentioned a system that unexpectedly intensifies, uh, Hurricane Emily. Uh, about six years ago with Hurricane uh, Tomas, we had a similar situation uh, where we were able to provide uh, information and kind of self-activated our net to provide that information. Uh, uh, we have a, a AOL Instant Messenger chat room that we use uh, on the VOIP Hurricane Net side, and uh, we attempt to prepare our, our participants ahead of time uh, by involvement in the communications test that WX4NHC does at the beginning of the hurricane season. We try to also have some training topics on some of our uh, uh, prep nets that we do, uh, as I said, on a monthly basis in the non-hurricane season months. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, in the hurricane season, we ramp up to uh, uh, weekly. Uh, it's a forum where we uh, just uh, exchange weather data. We'll uh, give uh, comments on, uh, on everybody's regional weather. Uh, our actual activations run quite a bit differently than the regular net, but it's a way for us to get together, way for our net controls to gather some, some training and, and so forth. Our website again is voipwx.net. And kind of the philosophy here is we can access a, a segment of the amateur radio community that we may not be able to access, those that either don't have HF licenses or don't have the capability to put up HF equipment. You know, it's a way to reach out to a lot of these people, those that may not be licensed yet uh, with uh, uh, the permissions and the classes for HF. That's what we're trying to do from uh, folks that may have, uh, you know, be Echolink PC users, could even be using an app on their cell phone now on Echolink. Uh, those that use IRLP, all radio based, uh, until it gets into the internet system, it links the radio systems uh, uh, over the internet you know, it expands who we may be able to talk to uh, at the local level. And all of, all of these disasters and, and situations we have, they start locally, and then they may expand regionally and so forth, but they start at the local level. So the contact to the local level is really key to providing the information that uh, wx 4 NHC needs. Uh, technical information, you know, there are a number of ways to uh, configure your nodes and, 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 and equipment. We certainly can help with that. Um, one of the key things on Echolink is we uh, 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 kick out stations that may have conferencing enabled, and unfortunately in Echolink it's on by default, but it's pretty easy to disable it. Uh, it's basically to just prevent unintentional interference uh, that, that can occur, because someone who connects to you in a conference doesn't necessarily know where your station may be connected to. So it really keeps the interference level down since we have uh, done that. And uh, we have that information uh, uh, on our website as well. Uh, for Echolink users uh, that are on repeaters, uh, the main thing is we like to eliminate the repeater IDs and the courtesy tones, and there are ways to do that where it will go out over the radio, but it won't go out over the, the actual internet system. Uh, so there, there are ways to do that, and we have folks that can uh, talk about how that can be done. Uh, several VOIP net members do have access uh, to DSTAR, uh, myself personally, I'm looking a little bit at, at the DMR technology as well. You know, try to cover some of these other uh, modes. There's also the All Star Network, which I know has been active in parts of South Florida, that can also connect into our system. So, trying to handle all of these uh, digital voice modes and 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 supporting the Hurricane Center uh, in that in that area, because and I, I totally understand what Julio's talking about. It's not that we don't want to use these modes. I have the same problem. Uh, running our operations at WX1 VOX, we want to be able to get into as many modes as we can. We only have so many operators, so many things that we can monitor at once. So when we have more folks that can help us relay, uh, that helps us out greatly. And again, it's not that we're against one technology or the other. It's just a it's just a matter of resources and ability uh, to monitor all these different things. As we prepare for 2016, there'll be the WX4 NHC communications test. Uh, right around the start of hurricane season that we'll be involved in. Uh, we are always looking for net controls for our net, if folks are interested. Uh, we do have a net control training slide deck that uh, 
hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, we will get out there uh, this year. It's been a couple of years since we've run that. We're always looking to recruit um, uh, contacts within all of the different affected areas uh, along the U.S. and East and Gulf Coast uh, and internationally. Uh, we're always looking uh, to uh, connect with folks. Uh, we are also connected up with uh, Bob and the Canadian Hurricane Center and some of the folks uh, there. They have a pretty extensive Echolink and IRLP network up in uh, Canada uh, as well. Also, weather stations. We will monitor uh, the weather stations that are on Weather Underground, APRS, CWAP. You know, there's a lot of data out there, but you got to have people that, that are able to look at it. So we're kind of a force multiplier in looking at a lot of those systems. Uh, and we're always looking to try to keep, make sure we have the, the resource depth in case we get affected in New England, um, which has happened a couple times here in the, in the last few years, though not by a direct landfalling hurricane, at least yet. So then activations from last year, um, we didn't have any formal activations. We just didn't have, on, uh, in, the two, in, the, in a few of the hurricanes that did occur, the radio paths uh, to get to some of these areas. However, we used some other ways to gather information. Um, there's the stormkrib.com storm blogger site. Believe it or not, I've seen some amateur radio operators posting information on that site. We try to intercept that data and get that into the hands of WX4NHC. Uh, in, in Bermuda, I have a contact uh, who I met through stormkrib.com, and she would give us information on what's happening on the island, damage reports, things that she uh, uh, was seeing. Uh, she did that again uh, this year with uh, Joaquin. Uh, with Hurricane Patricia, we, there was a weather station on the APRS CWAP in that Camila Cuitzmala area of Mexico. It's a very rural area, and I learned yesterday from Dr. Klotzbeck's uh, uh, talk that it was a, a, a state park or a reservation area that it hit. So it was a Category 5 that went through the woods. So very lucky that it didn't really hit any populated areas. And then believe it or not, we've already had a hurricane this year. Uh, that was Hurricane Alex that impacted the Azores. And there was some question of, is it really a hurricane? But if you looked at the satellite imagery and such, it, it definitely had those characteristics. But I think where we were lucky is the winds just didn't make it down to the surface as they could have. And there was an amateur radio weather station kind of very near the center of that, of that system that we were monitoring and gathering reports from. The winds never really made it to the, to the hurricane force levels, uh, despite the impressive uh, uh, nature of it on satellite. And I think it did start to weaken as it approached the Azores. Uh, in uh, southern New England, where I live in the New Bedford area, we actually have a large Portuguese population, including folks uh, from the Azores. And I was even enlisting in their support if there was damage on the islands that we could gather that information from those sources. And that's part of what we're really good at. You know, Dr. Nab emphasized that earlier, our ability to gather the, this information from areas where they may not have the reach. These are a number of the websites. Um, we'll have uh, this information archived, but you can see about IRLP nodes in your area, how to set up Echolink. Uh, you go to our website, voipwx.net. You see we're also on Facebook under voipwxnet and on Twitter under voipwxnet. And we have a Yahoo group email uh, list as well that folks can join. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll, we're also willing to help assist with folks with some of the technical aspects of Echolink and IRLP uh, for those that have uh, questions. And this is the contact information for a bunch of us on the net management team. Uh, feel free to reach out to us, uh, and all this information is on our website as well. So that's uh, the talk on the VOIP hurricane net. Now I'm going to switch gears to a little bit about best practices in Skywarn for tropical and, and post-tropical systems basically sub-hurricanes because, you know, and I'll mention here, these are some of the, some of the photos we have. You'll see uh, credits to the different uh, groups here uh, in pulling together this uh, presentation and uh, also some screenshots from the HuraVac uh, tracking program. Um, hurricanes are definitely one of the most powerful uh, systems. They prompt activations of our hurricane nets, but a lot of times we have weaker tropical systems that our hurricane nets don't typically activate for strong tropical storms, uh, uh, post-tropical systems, and one of the things that I've thought about is, well, if our hurricane nets aren't active, are, are our hand community thinking, well, we're out of the woods, I don't have to worry about it, you know, nothing that we really have to do, I can just kind of move on. Well, they, these systems can still be kind of dangerous, 
and they also can prompt a local or regional response, uh, you know, working with your uh, local National Weather Service Forecast Office or your local emergency management, uh, depending on what the, the system actually does. Uh, so some tropical storms, depending on their size and intensity, can, can have significant impacts, you know, maybe even impacts that are similar to, to hurricanes. Uh, many of these tropical systems can interact with other features. You already heard about the South Carolina case, and I'll talk a little bit about that here and, and, and some other cases. And then, uh, especially, we deal with this a, a lot in the uh, northern latitudes, as Bob pointed out. A system transitioning from tropical to post-tropical can sometimes contain the same threats of a tropical system or worse. These systems get really large, and then they affect a much larger area. Uh, so these are some of the things that, that you know, we want to educate folks on and make sure people are prepared for on the personal level and then also prepared to support their uh, local agent, local and regional agencies, your National Weather Service offices, and so forth. So we'll look at several examples of, of these systems. And, you know, there's, a, there's many cases that you can cover, and we certainly don't have time to cover them all, but we're going to cover a few aspects. Uh, some cases, the tropical system was sub-hurricane strength, but had impacts where, geez, it seemed like it was a hurricane. Uh, other cases, uh, the tropical system didn't really cause any direct impacts or minimal direct impacts, but they were in the area and interacting with other weather features, cold fronts, uh, other systems caused a significant impact in, in, in an area. And then yet in other cases, you have a tropical system that's transitioning to a post-tropical cyclone or maybe has characteristics of both and uh, they become a, a, a significant problem for a local or regional area. Uh, tropical storms and depressions and post-tropical systems, they're all the same threats of hurricanes, just maybe at different magnitudes, maybe a, a more localized significant impact, but still very potent and something that has to be dealt with at a local or regional level. So kind of case study number one is Charleston, South Carolina, the October floods and Hurricane Joaquin. Well, Hurricane Joaquin was well offshore. However, you know, the interaction with the frontal system as, uh, Bob, uh, as uh, Bobby had pointed out, kind of interacted with this hurricane and brought a lot of the heavy rainfall into the state. You know, you saw the, uh, uh, these are just a couple of the flooding pictures from the Charleston, South Carolina uh, weather office. Uh, these were, uh, this was a significant event. And, you know, definitely at the local regional level, Skywarn Nest should be active, you know, reporting in these conditions to their local uh, weather service office making sure that the emergency management agencies have their, that information for situational awareness for, for, those, for those situations that they don't already know about. So, you know, this is one example of, of a situation where, you know, there's not even a tropical storm watch or warning out, but a very significant and historic uh, weather situation took place. Case study number two was Hurricane Arthur. So you see kind of in the top right-hand corner you know, Arthur is headed towards our friends in the Canadian Maritimes for more of a direct hit. We got a little side swipe of tropical storm force winds and some isolated tree and wire damage on Cape Cod. But the biggest thing about this system was that heavy rainfall. We had a cold front and, and on the day before uh, Arthur, uh, making its closest pass to southern New England, caused a lot of severe weather, severe thunderstorms, wind damage, hail, etc. And that front kind of stuck around as Arthur made the uh, turn and uh, as I said scraped the Cape and Islands with some winds but the interaction between Arthur and the cold front called, caused very heavy rainfall. Eight inches of rain in my home city of New Bedford, Mass. And the two pictures below, one from Ed Karen K one RSY and one from myself are some of the flooding <coughs> pictures out of my, my very own home city. I can't tell you how many flooded basements there were in the city of New Bedford from this incident. A flash flood emergency was issued for our area because of the amount of flooded streets, flooded basements. Uh, there was actually a, a drone video of, of the flooding. It was a pretty significant flood event for us. But again, not really a direct impact from a hurricane. Hurricane nets aren't going to be up for it. But at the local regional Skywarn level, we had to be vigilant, we had to be ready, and we had to be ready to report this information into our local weather service office and, and other entities. <clears throat> Hurricane Irene. Well, Hurricane Irene weakened to a tropical storm as it approached southern New England. The yellow indicates the wind field of sustained winds of 50 knots or, or, or greater in the hurricane force wind gusts that occurred. 
You know, there were over 1.7 million people without power across the three states of southern New England. This was only a tropical storm. You know, okay, a 70 mile per hour tropical storm, what's the difference between that and a category one hurricane? Very little, but that's the point. Make significant impacts. The lower left hand picture is the flooding in Vermont. That's just a, one of many, many pictures of significant flooding in that state from a, an amateur radio operator there. And then on the lower right hand corner is the wind damage that occurred on the east side of the system with the uh, large tree down on the car uh, right there in, in a cushionet mass just outside of New Bedford. Historic impacts. The system's not a hurricane when it affected us. We are still waiting for our first landfalling hurricane since Hurricane Bob in 1991. Sandy. Well, technically, right, you know, by all accounts, people consider this a hurricane, but by the technical nature meteorologically, it was a post-tropical cyclone. There weren't even hurricane warnings up, and obviously there's been a lot of changes now in this because of the nature of these kind of systems. But again, another case of preparedness. You know, while there were no hurricane warnings up, it was about the impacts. There's going to be major storm surge. This system's going into southern New Jersey, and we had hurricane force wind gusts in southern New England, several hundred miles away. You look in the, in the graphic up above, the wind field, you know, the blue field is the winds of 34 knots or greater covering, you know, well, you know, half of the east coast. And the yellow is the 50 knot wind field, and then the red is the, the actual hurricane uh, strength uh, winds. You know, major damage, major storm surge, major wind damage and power outages to the mid-Atlantic. And even up in our area, we had over 400,000 without power in Massachusetts, and the center was down in southern New Jersey. Just a significant system. So again, think about the, you know, from a preparedness perspective from both yourselves personally, and then being able to respond from a Skywarn and Aries perspective. One more case from New England, and then I'll have a case closer to home. This was a post-tropical cyclone named Noel. This system was well offshore, but we had winds of hurricane force on Cape Cod and the islands. The Canadian Maritimes suffered significant damage from this system. Uh, we had wind gusts to uh, uh, over uh, 50 and 60 miles per hour well in the eastern mass, with the Cape and Islands having the hurricane force wind gusts. And we had shelter operations for about 36 hours on the Cape and Islands. Again, just another example of a system and not being a hurricane, but kind of originating from being a hurricane, causing significant issues. And then case study number six, and I was so happy to hear Dr. Nav mention Devi, which was just, again, a tropical storm, but caused record rainfall, flash flooding, uh, affected the St. Mary's River, the Sewanee and Santa Fe Rivers with uh, record flooding. Again, a situation of we need to be ready to report in these conditions to our local weather service office. Again, just a tropical storm, you know, significant flooding of urban areas. And in the screenshot are some of the rain totals and records that were broken by Debbie because she sat over the area for a long period of time causing the heavy rainfall not far from you know, right where we are here in Orlando. So a bit of an education on, well, we're waiting for that hurricane to come, and it will come, and, you know, as Bobby has pointed out. But we've had systems less than that cause some very significant issues in parts of the country. So again, making sure your home preparedness is there. You know, while a communications emergency may not occur, very important to get this information out from a Skywarn weather spotter perspective. You know, don't think that the media or social media necessarily has it covered. You know, we are a, a, a trusted entity to gather this information. Great for situational awareness and disaster intelligence and kind of being a force multiplier in providing the information. Um, you know, this is something that we've done, you know, very successfully in, in, in southern New England. I've heard many of, of this, much of this happening for severe weather and other cases. And it applies, you know, very well with these tropical systems that are below hurricane strength. You know, in, in, in our minds, when there's a hurricane, the only difference should be that you're finding that path or liaison to the hurricane watch net or the VOIP hurricane net and, and into WX4NHC to share a lot of this information. Um, that's really the only difference. When you have a tropical storm or some of these other situations that we're talking about at a local and regional level, there's still a lot of information, situational awareness, information from weather stations, 
you know, the reporting criteria from Skyline should be shared at the local or regional level. Because all significant weather events and disasters are, are, are local, uh, and that's, you know, very important. You know, the other piece is, you know, in kind of closing this out, you know, we are the original form of social media. So we're there when all else fails. Everybody talks about that. But we're also the original form of social media. We're the ones that were providing and still are providing the information that, you know, quite a bit of what you see in social media. So we can provide our own social media information and criteria. We can provide uh, a way to manage what's out there in the modern social media outlets and really provide a solid situational awareness picture uh, for, for emergency management, for the weather service, for media, and any other entities that find the information useful.